Perfecto. Bon dia a tothom. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's always exciting to be on stage and, and humbly share our learnings from our fun ride at Charbus. But I'm, I'm especially thrilled to be here today, right? This is Barcelona. This is the city where I was born. This is the city that, where I grew up and I lived until, until I was 20, 22. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm Pepe. Uh, I will lead the international efforts at Charbus. For those who are not familiar with, with Charbus, um, Charbus is a platform for mobile game developers. We help game developers from all sizes build a solid business. That means that we help them with two things that are very important. Acquiring valuable users, first of all, valuable players, but then monetizing. Our fund ride started in 2011. Our founders come from, from a company called Tap, Tapulus, the, the company behind Tap Tap Revenge, which was one of the top game, music games on the App Store, e even before the App Store was born. Obviously, they learned a lot about how to make a successful game, how the App Store works, how to make money. And then they decided to help other game developers replicate their success. And this is how Charboost got started. Today, Charboost is a way different company. We have over 60,000 games on our platform doing cross promotions with each other. They're acquiring valuable users, they're partnering, they're, they're exchanging users through our platform. We have more than 100 people. We have two offices, one in San Francisco, where we're based, and, and in Amsterdam, uh, which is our latest office to manage the European, the, European, um, the European business. And then we were very happy to announce our partnership with Sequoia in the beginning of last year. Obviously, that, me that meant for us that we're a company to stay. We're a solid company that will help all business, uh, all, all game developers build successful businesses. So I wanted to ask the audience what happened on July 10th, 2008. Who knows what happens that day? Anyone? See some faces here that are smiling? So that day, the App Store was launched, the iOS App Store. We had iPhones, but we didn't have an App Store. That obviously changed dramatically the way developers built their creations and distributed their creations. Suddenly, we had millions of iPhones available for us, entrepreneurs, to just promote our content, to reach our uh, users. But for me, the most, the most important change that 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 cost that that generated was that everyone and from anywhere could build a global business. But that's challenging, especially when you're starting. Reaching the world is it's very, very challenging. So my goal for this presentation is to go through 10 things that I've learned about building global businesses. So there's only 10 points. If hopefully it doesn't get too boring, but if you're bored, at least you will know how much is missing. So number one, number one starts with you. You need to internationalize yourself. You need to become global. When I talk to entrepreneurs, I see a lot of passion, but sometimes I see that the reach, it's just very local. And that means traveling. That means speaking English at your office, even if you're in Spain, in Barcelona, with just Spaniards around you. Speak English, because that's the language that the world speaks. In my, in my case, I was very proud to have my parents, who actually pushed me outside the country, just learn French, learn English, learn German at some point. And I was lucky to be born in one of the best cities in the world, Barcelona, where we're now, but I knew that this is not the only place. I had to travel outside. I had to discover new horizons. So I studied in Zurich uh, at the ETH. That opened a new horizon for me. I also worked at Hilti in Liechtenstein in this tiny country in the middle of the Alps. And then five years ago, I decided to go with my girlfriend, who now is, now is my wife, to San Francisco where I wanted to learn from peer entrepreneurs. I wanted to get inspired by all these people that are thinking big and making their creations come true. So first point, internationalize yourself. Become a global entrepreneur. Number two is be aware of your global impact. Mobile is global by nature. We have an app store that reaches every country in the world, almost every country in the world. So just be aware of where your users are. 
Charbuz was born in, at the Pier 38 in San Francisco. It's a very inspiring space that unfortunately is not there anymore. It was just a desk. Sean and Maria were founders and the initial team started knocking on the wall, and oh, sorry, on the door of a lot of game developers just selling their story, selling their vision, selling, in, in, transmitting their passion. And we realized immediately that our early adopters were these apps, Fluic, these companies, Fluic, Neon Play, Kilu, IMS, and they were not from San Francisco. They were from Canada, UK, Denmark, Greece. It's a global industry, and you need to find ways to reach them. Today, the scene is even, even worse or even more exciting. This is, this is actually the number of logins that, that we were having when I created this presentation. These are my users. These are the people that are impacted by my product. I need to be aware of where they are, how are they using my product, and I need to establish communication channels with them. Very important. Understand how to convey a message that reaches all these people from anywhere. And that takes me to the next point, because while you're aware of your global impact, you need to stay local. And staying local for us has been very important since the beginning. We establish very solid partnerships with our developers. We do workshops. This is actually from Deaf Sisters in Korea, one of our early adopters in that country. We do workshops where we just sit down with them, we share experiences, we just teach how to use our product and how can they benefit from the solution we're providing them. So whatever your industry is, if you're in mobile, be aware that you need to shake hands. You need to go to their offices. You need to share their problems. You need to get product feedback. And this is also the reason why last year we decided to establish an office in Amsterdam. We wanted to be closer to our European developers. Europe for us is very important. And we wanted to be accessible. We wanted to offer them a better service, better, better support, better account management. And this is why we decided to go to Amsterdam, which is a very interesting hub in Europe that very well communicated with San Francisco and with the rest of the European region. Stay local. Number four is, especially when you grow, you want to make sure that as you build offices, you have one team, and more importantly, one culture. Obviously, things are done differently in every country. Um, our Amsterdam office doesn't work exactly the same as the San Francisco office. It's smaller, dynamics are different, but it's one team, one culture. When we decided to go to Amsterdam, we had already a pretty solid team in San Francisco. We had obviously a, a very well-structured engineering team. We had product management. The business team was very organized as well. We had marketing support, biz dev, account management. And then we decided to go to Amsterdam and replicate some of the functions, biz dev, support, and account management especially. Obviously, there are a lot of parallel events, a lot of parallel processes, but we need to make sure that there's always a sync. I didn't know how many decisions were made on the hallways in the San Francisco office. And you need to document all that. Otherwise, the disconnect between the two teams is just tremendous, and you need to avoid that. Today, luckily, we have, we have very cool tools. I don't want to promote anyone specifically, but these are some of the tools that startups have accessible today to foster that connection between, between teams. We use Atlassian. They have Jira for tickets. Um, they have Confluence for documentation. Obviously, we use Salesforce as a CRM. Great tool to make sure that everyone on the business team is on the same page. And we also have Zendesk for support tickets. Amazing tools. Some of them are even not that pricey, so, so they're very accessible for startups to make sure that they're, everyone in the team is on the same page. But also, um, I, was I was telling you about the cultural aspect, very important. Make sure that you have common values. We never thought about what our values were and, until we actually grew so much that we wanted to make sure that there was something core in our team that actually uh, identified everyone at Charbus. We talk about transparency, about getting shit done, that, ac that action of making things happen. You need to make sure that everyone you hire have these common teams, no matter where they are. Common values is very important. Weekly, things, I don't need to tell you too much about this, but as I said, there are a lot of decisions that are made just by walking, and 
talking to, to your peers uh, at the office. You need to make sure that they're documented and that they, they, they're uh, weekly syncs. And then, obviously, um, making, making a similar benefit policy. Um, we do a lot of offsites. Obviously, we try to coordinate the, the ones in Amsterdam with the ones in, in San Francisco. But also, I mean, if you offer lunches on, on one of the offices, make sure that they also get some perks on the other offices. That also creates a culture. I learned a lot about hiring in Silicon Valley, where, where the talent is actually very, uh, it's, uh, we're, it's very hard to get. And obviously, you need to sell your company culture. And benefits and perks are part of your company cultures, the outings, the, the lunches, the, the possibility to work from home. All this creates also your, your company culture. And then it also creates your brand. Number five, turn your clients into ambassadors. That's been the most, that, that's been the key of our success actually at Charbus. And for me, it has two, two ingredients. The first one is always providing a very high class service. Emails, track how long does it take you to answer emails. It's very important. If people send, if someone sends you an email asking for something, that means that they're thinking about you. If you can answer immediately, the level of satisfaction will increase tremendously. Make sure that you answer always very fast. So the, 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 the response, the service. But it also means, um, I like a term that uh, we're talking a lot about, about it in Silicon Valley, which is the growth hacking. There are components of your platform, of your product, that actually enable that becoming, uh, that, that becoming an ambassador of the product. There, there are those components that make the platform scalable. In our case, is the, the ability to do direct deals. We have the, the social kind of social network where you see some of the most popular games, and companies can just reach out to each other. They can partner and exchange. We even have a messaging, a messaging tool. That, for us, was fantastic for growth because it, it's way more powerful to have a developer reaching out to another developer and say, hey, do you want to buy, sell, or exchange users with me? We use Charbus to do that because it's the most reliable tool. It's always the client who reaches out another client uh, the most powerful tool, way more powerful than the, be the, than the best salesman that you can have. So just create that love for your product. Make sure that your clients, your partners, become actual ambassadors of the platform because in the end, there's nothing stronger than a referral. The number six is about building a brand. And obviously, when you're starting, you have a lot of, you have a lot of challenges, right? You're lacking out of budget. You, 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 you don't have probably not even the talent. If you're a tech company, probably your founders are, the, the, the co-founders are tech people. You need to make sure that even if you're a very solid technical company, you need to make sure that you invest in building a brand. I told you about the perks and the benefits that the companies can have to build a brand. But building a brand and marketing, what I've learned is that it's way bigger and broader than just doing some user acquisition, than doing an event. It's really positioning the company. Decide where you want to be. How, you, how, do you wanna, how do you want the company to be seen? In our case, we are a developer-first company. Obviously, we're in the advertising world, and we compete with Facebook. I, I know Mark will, will be here a little bit later, so, so yeah, we compete with them. And for us, it's actually very challenging to compete with big advertising companies like Facebook, Google, now Twitter. But we don't, we don't consider ourselves an ad network. We do have an ad network, but we're not an advertising company. We are a developer-first company. And that means that everything we do inspires developers to work with us, inspires developers to build better businesses. We do events like the SDK Burger Challenge. The SDK is the software that we offer to our mobile uh, developers. Um, there are thousands of SDKs out there. So we did an event that was basically a food truck where we were offering burgers for free, and we were challenging every developer that we could install the SDK faster than they, could, they, they can eat a burger. That's stupid. But it helps so much because developers could understand, okay, how, how long does it take for me to eat a burger? Two minutes? 
the SDK can be integrated in less than two minutes. We do hackathons, we do happy hours with developers, where we don't even talk about ourselves. I don't want to talk about Charboost. I just want to be the glue of the community. I just want to be the, 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 the technology that actually connects developers and helps developers succeed. So once you've positioned your company, make sure that your, every aspect of your business transmits that, that vision. Number seven. That's, that's very specific to my industry, but I'm sure you guys can find ways of doing free user acquisition, free distribution of your business. In my case, I think I work with a lot of developers that are very smart on leveraging the calendar. Leveraging the calendar means something as simple as if you have a, a tennis game, just put, launch it on during Wimbledon, because people are looking for keywords they're looking for tennis, they're looking for tennis matches, and your game will pop up. And these guys, who are two guys from San Francisco, working out of their garage, got this amount of traction. They were number 26 in the US, number 15 in the UK, and so on. And that was only because they launched during Wimbledon. I'm sure each business has different aspects. Each business has different ways of, of leveraging the calendar. But the good thing is that the calendar is global as well. Understand what is important in, in each region. We have many holidays during the day, uh, sorry, the, during the year. Make sure that you have things for Christmas. You adapt your game for Christmas. You have a, a, a theme for, for all these uh, uh, holidays, Halloween, Valentine's Day. You have Chinese New Year's. Our traffic increases 20% in China during Chinese New Year's. And this is free, it's just, it's just a holiday. Let's just make sure that all the Chinese developers know that there are users out there playing their games. So leverage the calendar, it's free, and it's very powerful. Number eight, I don't need to convince you, probably you're here because you believe in mobile. It's a now industry. We're not talking about the future, we're talking about now. In the case of games, I mean, I, I brought some numbers to you, but I mean, I don't need to convince you. Two billion mobile handsets were, were actually sold last year. We have over a million apps on the App Store, on both apps, uh, on the iOS App Store, but also on Google Play. It's tremendous. The app revenue increased 62% last year. Just get out there. Get part of these revenues. 43% of the downloads were actually games. This is the most important category in the, in the App Store. And 75% of the money spend on apps was actually spent on games. These are the sources, but uh, again, I don't need to convince you. It's a now industry. Don't waste your time, just launch it now. Choose your moment and jump. That's my, my, my learning is that there's never a good moment to start your business. We always have excuses. It's like having a kid. There's never a good moment to have a kid. Yeah, your expectations are high. You, you want to make sure that your business model is there, that you have a product that is solid. Just jump. We're in an industry that allows iteration. Launch it, test, listen, and then iterate. But jump now. And I wanted to bring you some examples. Some of the most popular games today were actually started by two guys, by one guy. Actually, Imanji, the developers of Temple Run, it's just a, it's a, it's a married couple from, from Washington. He tennis, I told you about that tennis game. Two guys from San Francisco. Nimblebeat, um, it's a company from, from San Diego. It's two brothers. And they have a global impact today. And that's because they believe they had a good product, but they've iterated. They just jumped, and they, they made sure that they were listening to their, to their clients, to their users. So jump, because there's never a good moment to do it. Just do it now. And my last piece of advice is always have fun. Being a global entrepreneur is not sexy as a job. It means waking up very early to have calls with Europe. This is my life, every day talking to Europe in the morning. It means tons of meetings the, during the day in San Francisco. And then when I'm only thinking about going home, Asia is waking up and I need to jump on calls to, 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 to my, with my Asian partners. Being a global entrepreneur is not sexy. So the least thing you can do is hire people that you admire, hire, hire people that you actually enjoy working with. And this is something we have very deep in our company. We always have fun. We have fun between us, and we have fun with our partners. 
This is a party that we did last year, sorry, that last week in, in Amsterdam. And these are, this is the Rovio guys just having fun with us because it's fun what we need to, to, to have in order to be successful and to spend so many hours working on our vision. So this is it for today. Hopefully, uh, I've given you some, some good insights. I'll be around the, the rest of the morning, and if you have any specific questions, I'd love to take them. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you, baby, for your presentation. Alexander Chekanov from Masada Business School. Um, my question is, when you were launching the platform, do you have any ideas or forecasts about how it could go? Because, um, I mean, this is a platform where you depend on developers. And the more developers are in the platform, the more developers will be eager to join. But then, how were this first uh, month? Um, how the feel was? How how the team was feeling? And uh, what were your, your impressions about that? Yeah, that, that's. Thank you so much for your question, Alex. Um, that's that's actually. It's a, a very good question. Um, Charboost actually started with a free product. So the first part of that, the, the first features that we offer was the internal cross promotion. We were helping game developers just promote their own titles, and that was free. Obviously, that's challenging because especially when you're starting and you don't have a lot, <laughs> a lot of run rate uh, to survive, it's it's very challenging. But this is the only way to get traction. Uh, people need to touch and experience your product before fully uh, getting full trust, right? So the internal cross-promotion was our way because it was free, and we knocked on a lot of doors saying, hey, we have an SDK that will allow you easily do that internal cross-promotion. Um, because we did that, uh, and it was free again, it helped us a lot get traction. And then the next step, which was the paid step, was natural because we already had a, a certain critical mass, and that, that this is when they started exchanging users or buying from each other. But the first step normally starts with a free product, a free product, product that is good, but, um, but a free product because that you're lowering the, the barriers of entry, and then um, once you have them on the platform, then you can start monetizing with, uh, with it. But um, I mean, we've seen a lot of companies being tremendously evaluated uh, with a free product, right? So, so actually, there's ways to survive. In our case, we didn't have much savings, so we had to find the monetization uh, path pretty easily, pretty fast. Sorry. Any other questions? Cool.